Kurt was like, he was counterculture, but then he also really wanted to be really famous. Like he was like a windmill and he would just say one thing and then he would like change his mind on it. And then I would like even point it out and say, do you know what you just said? And he, he, he'd laugh because he knew I'd, he knew he was busted. Like you just contradicted yourself, right? But you hear it in the lyrics too. Like he could just kind of go and I don't know what, you know, they made the documentary on him that was good. The documentary was a good, Inside and to like where he which one where his mind the um montage of heck mm -hmm. i remember montage of heck the tape he made my brother remembers it too we could quote from that we listened to that so many you times. mean the little the, the little samples that he's oh, throwing man, together he would I do all I... kinds he was this avant-garde artist and he, he was would a make these collages mm -hmm. collages of like and, seconds it was crazy to listen he to. was a great painter a uh, great musician, a sculptor. Like I have this pipe that he made out of clay and it's this like withering spirit, tortured spirit person. Of course, it's always weird and dark and twisted and just like, wow. And then all of a sudden you're like on the cover of like all these magazines. It's, it's, like, like, you like, got, it's like you guys got shot out of a cannon. We got shot out of a cannon. And like we're like- <laughs> At all, a wall. I had a wall or something. It's like, what is this world we're in? And then he had his own thing. He had to deal with that drug addiction. And that's that's what tore him down. He just couldn't. It was too powerful. It just should have never happened. Kim, then you guys have this massive record. <laughs> Super unknown record that came out. And it's melancholy. This is a melancholy. Melancholy. Song. A little bit psychedelic. Psy definitely a lot psychedelic. psychedelic. In my eyes, in this pose, in this guy's no one. <laughs> same, knows. same weird thing. Leslie. Yeah. What part are you playing on here? What's that? What part are you playing on here? What part? Yes. What is it? The picking part of the guitar. Oh, oh, is that you or is that Chris? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. I, I, I've been asked that a lot recently. And I think it's, it's really weird. I remember learning the arpeggio part. But I remember not feeling really comfortable playing it because it was atypical of the way I played. And I remember... I think I remember trapping it, but I think I remember saying to Chris, why don't you just do this intro and I'll come in on the I'll come in with the heavy guitar, that's me there. And I always had a resistance to it. It seemed it sounded like a bunch of fairies dancing, you know, on, on something. It, it I remember hearing that and thinking, I can't play that. That's too <laughs> delicate. It's like the it's the right hand on the piano. It's like, you know, a boom, boom. No, it was it was too tinkly and I was like, and Chris played on, uh, played it part on this demo, so I'm learning it, and I'm like, I do, I love arpeggios, and all our early stuff is writing arpeggios, and these are like little arpeggio triplets, and I'm like, I can't do it like this with a Leslie and really clean sound. It was too, just too delicate. You know, I'm gonna break this. I can't do this. And I, I, to this day, I can't remember. Uh, according to Adam Casper, I'm on that. I'm, I'm on the intro of the tracking. Um, but I think Chris, I think I said, why don't you play this and I'll play the, the distorted guitar and come in on the, uh, on the verses. So I can hear me on the, uh, on the, uh, on the choruses and the bridges and stuff because I changed a few things that Chris had written. Um, uh, I, I moved some of the chords around to make them sound a little bit more uh, sunset-like. And but you the, play this insane solo on there. And then the weird solo and, and, and part of, yeah. And then there's the second solo, but it's not really a solo. It's me sort of accenting mm -hmm. the, the vocals. Um, so I know this for a fact, though. That slide at the beginning, mm -hmm. that's Chris. Neither of us knew how to play slide, and and uh, he, I was able to, I was I was able to mute the strings other than the ones that I'm sliding on. I can just I can mute them with my right hand. Uh, Chris couldn't do either, so he took all the strings off except for the one string. <laughs> so it's just this is one string, and he just went ee. Because uh, that's one of the difficulties of playing slide is, is to make sure that you're not sounding the whole damn thing. Um, I was able to do that with my right hand and not the left. And, and so I, I know that 
I, I remember that. I remember watching him would just take one string on a guitar and just play that. When he wrote that song, did he come in and play the demo for you guys? Yes, and it was it was it's almost exact same response for uh, for uh, that we had with uh, "Smells Like Teen Spirit." We played that, and Matt just Matt heard it, and he said, "Oh yeah, that that's that's a hit." And it and it was obvious to everyone that this this thing that's it was obvious to me, and st still there's that resistance. It's like loud guitars, you know, distortion, craziness, you know. And you hear that, it's like, oh, yeah. Hero came in when we were rehearsing, probably at a vast, and the hero heard a demo that uh, that we were doing of that, and he started laughing. <clears throat> and, and I said echoes of Ben pointing at the cassette and saying that about Smells Like Teen Spirit. And it was Hero saying, that's your hit. That's your hit. The hero who's also very, you know, alternative and, and cynical and... And smart guy, and now he's laughing and looking at us. That's it. That's your hit. And and Ben started laughing. He goes, "Oh my God! It's, I can't believe we're doing something this candy." <laughs> but he's like, he goes, "It's." But he knew that that this is great. This is a great song. But he, same thing. That laughing, like we're doing this. This is an interesting song because of all the changes that it has. In yeah, it's, very it's crazy. For, it's really piano-like. Like, like. More than the typical indie rock song would have. Oh, my God. This is so totally. sophisticated. Very, when I did a breakdown. The arrangement is very sophisticated. The, the arrangement, but the chord progression is so sophisticated. It keeps changing totally. keys. Now, this is a thing that the two bands share, and I always am preaching this about your bands, is how sophisticated your music was. Even though you have this punk rock ethos, this, these these influences, indie rock, things like that. These songs like Lithium, for example, or Drain You, they have all these chord changes, really sophisticated melodies. The melody to Smells Like Teen Spirit is very sophisticated. The notes that Kurt goes to over the chord progressions. This song, so many of your songs have very sophisticated rhythms. They have sophisticated chord changes, all the weird tunings. But this song is just... It's crazy. It's all over the place, and yet it's so melodic. And that's the thing that both bands share, is this, these, these sophisticated songs. You don't even realize how complex they are unless you actually sit down and analyze it's them. It's not gratuitous prog, though. No. It's all no, it's in not, service not to the song. Yeah. Always in service that, to, that, to that the song. That verse arpeggio part, I still can't believe it that he wrote that on guitar. It sounds like something someone would write on piano. Right. And and that's the thing is that most of us we'd write on guitar, except for Hero wrote on bass. Um, so we, it was always a guitar riff. There's a occasionally Chris would have a melody in his head, or he'd envision you know, you know, much of a song. Usually when driving, driving around, humming something. I think. And I'm not sure, I don't remember our conversations about this because there's so many different conversations we'd have about, about songs and, and, and our memories change. You know, it's like, what is it that you emphasize in your memory about writing a song or learning a song? But that doesn't sound like something that would have been initiated on guitar, like many of our riffs are. But with Chris, he'd often initiate things from a vocal melody, and then he'd Figure out what the chords were to go around it, which is yeah. which is a lot tougher to do. Yeah, but um, he was able to do that because he knew where, where the melody was and hear that, and then he and he'd, he'd pick up the guitar and figure out if it, if the guitar was changing the melody he had in his head, then then he knew that wasn't working. So, so now, did he realize what did he think about that song? Well. He didn't comment on it. He, you know, he, he would do writing. I mean, when he'd play you a demo, would he say, hey, check out this song? No. Would he... No, because he didn't want to influence, you know, our opinions. And he wouldn't let our opinions, you know, wouldn't let it get him down. Like, if we didn't like something, he's like, okay. Because he was becoming much more prolific. So if he only had one or two songs and we're like, oh, we're not really into that. We don't really feel like playing it. It might bum him out. But if he's... He kind of learned this from Andy Wood, um, who was a roommate of his for a while. Andy, mm -hmm. the singer from Mother Love Bone. Yeah. And Andy told him, 
Chris was wondering how Andy would just put out so much material. He was constantly writing and, and recording songs. And a lot of them were terrible, but Andy didn't care. It's like, just write them, just document them, just sketch, just demo. And he explained that to Chris. It's like, it's okay. The band isn't going to like everything, you know, and, and, and I'm not going to like everything. But I just, he would write it, he'd record it, and Chris picked that up from him. And it was probably one of the smartest things Chris did. He became super prolific. You know, that's, that's when he did, you know, Andy passed away and he, and he started writing out his ass. And then, you know, Temple of the Dog and, 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 uh, and then things like Rusty Cage. And so he wouldn't let him, that get him down anymore. He kind of learned that from, from Andy. He's like, they like it, cool. They like it. If they don't like it, cool. There's other songs. It's fine. He, he trusted our judgment for the most part and, and wouldn't let it inhibit him. He would just keep, keep writing. It's like, if they don't want to do it, we won't do it. It's fine. It's not our, our thing. Okay, so what would Kurt think about, what did Kurt think about Smells Like Teen Spirit? Oh, don't ask him. He'd be like, oh, that, I don't know. I can't talk for Kurt. I mean, he, <laughs> he's made statements about that or the, the way the record was mixed or whatever that I, I don't agree with. I think the record sounds great. The record sounds amazing. We came in, we recorded, we were gonna mix with Butch and then Butch wanted to take a few days off to rest his ears, but then the recording went over a few days, and so he had to start mixing right away. And so we went into this mixing studio, and then the Gary Gersh, who signed us to Geppen, he he really didn't think that the he didn't really like the mixes. And you can hear the Butch's mixes like on the yeah box set. That's right. For, for with with the lights out, mm -hmm. if, you know, if anybody want, is interested. And so then. Gary recommended that we try another mixer, and it was Andy Wallace. Yep. And so like, wow, who's Andy Wallace? It's like, well, he mixed Slayer. I was actually more asking about what he thought of it as a song, and what he thought of these things as songs. Just like I asked about Chris. Oh, Smells Like Teen Spirit? Yeah. You know, we were into that dynamic, just loud. You know, you come in, all right, let's just kind of come in with a bass you know, and the drums and just kind of build it up and then build it up and then, you know, throw it, boom, burn the lights out. You know what I mean? It's just like, that's, we, it seemed to work and we liked that, you know, we, and we heard other, like Pixies would do that and mm. Surfer Rosa, that they'd had that kind of thing and you know, we it, always liked it. And It was yeah. kind of Pavlovian with the live audiences in those days too. You know, when you'd hit that chorus, everybody would just crowd. Would just, yeah. It just... The dog would salivate. They would, the crowds would go nuts, you know. <laughs> well, there's a video of the first time we played that song at the OK Hotel, and it was just a madhouse. Ben was and there. And they'd never heard the song before. Yeah, yeah. And they'd never heard the song mm. before. People are just, like, flipping out. So there's something Amazing about that dynamic. dynamic you know, yep. you got Dave just boom, got that kick drum going, and Kurt so intense, you know, and just kind of bang, bang. It just kind of all came together, you know. I try to keep the bass steady, just boom, 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 just keep it steady. Try to be dependable, you know. Kind of. 